a book is being written about the Prime Minister's time in office. <laughs> Apparently, it's going to be out by Christmas. Is that the release date or the title? <laughs> Whether or not Liz Truss will still be in office by Christmas, she's already clearly lost all of her power. Yes, she's U-turned on her entire economic agenda and she's now lost her Home Secretary. Suella Braverman is out and she's been replaced by Grant Shapps, a key ally of Truss's arch nemesis, Rishi Sunak. Um, of course, this comes just five days after Liz Truss lost her Chancellor. To discuss... Another chaotic day in Westminster. I'm joined by Dahlia Gabriel. How are you doing, Dahlia? Good. It sounds like Liz Truss has had a pretty, like a chaotic day even by my standards, which is pretty impressive. A chaotic day even by her standards, which is even more impressive because Liz Truss's days are pretty um, chaotic these days. It makes it a little bit stressful in the studio, I have to say. Too many people resigning so soon before a show, um, but I suppose that's that's part of the job. And um, we do want to know your comments and your questions. Are you relieved that Suella Braverman is out of a job? Why do you think she is out of a job? Tweet on the hashtag Tisky Sour, or you can put your answers in the comments section. The departure of Suella Braverman was met with a lot of confusion in Westminster as to exactly what had gone on. Was this a resignation in protest at a failing prime minister? Was this Braverman being ousted by the more centrist Jeremy Hunt? Or had Braverman just messed up? Well, we can get some clue from her letter of resignation released a couple of hours ago. So in that, she said, Dear Prime Minister, it is with the greatest regret that I am choosing to tender my resignation. Earlier today, I sent an official document from my personal email to a trusted parliamentary colleague as part of a policy engagement and with the aim of garnering support for government policy on migration. This constitutes a technical infringement of the rules. As you know, the document was a draft written ministerial statement about migration due for publication imminently. Much of it had already been briefed to MPs. Nevertheless, it is right for me to go. She goes on, as soon as I realised my mistake, I rapidly reported this on official channels and informed the cabinet secretary. As home secretary, I hold myself to the highest standards and my resignation is the right thing to do. The business of government relies upon people accepting responsibility for their mistakes, pretending we haven't made mistakes, carrying on as if everyone can't see we have made them and hoping that things will magically come right is not serious politics. I have made a mistake. I accept responsibility. I resign. So the suggestion there is that Braverman resigned for making an honest mistake. She sent an official document via a personal communication channel and so had to go. But the point about taking responsibility was obviously a not very subtle dig at the Prime Minister who stayed in her job after tanking the economy. Those criticisms, though, became more explicit. So in the next paragraph, she said this. It is obvious to everyone that we are going through a tumultuous time. I have concerns about the direction of this government. Not only have we broken key pledges that were promised to our voters, but I have had serious concerns about this government's commitment to honouring manifesto commitments, such as reducing overall migration numbers and stopping illegal migration, particularly the dangerous small boat crossings. So it's Suella Braverman saying that Liz Truss isn't far right enough for her, essentially. The voters, I assume she was sort of referencing the first part of that paragraph with the voters in the Tory leadership election. Liz Truss had promised to them um, that corporation tax would not be arisen. She's already U-turned on that. And then she's talking about those manifesto commitments, which to her seems to mean um, things to do with, with migration. And that's the official story. Braverman made a mistake, so resigned, and she doesn't much like the government she resigned from anyway. But is there something deeper going on? Well, there are a few theories flying around. Paul Goodman is from Conservative Home, so he tweeted this. Understand that the background to the Braverman resignation was the mother of all rows about migration. Told she was under pressure from Number 10 to announce a liberalising migration plan, which would have made it easier for the OBR, so that's the Office for Budget Responsibility, to say the government would hit growth targets. So the suggestion there, it's a principled resignation, obviously principled for odious reasons. But Braverman was asked, can you liberalise or get rid of these migration targets so it's easier for us to meet our economic growth targets? She says no, therefore she goes. Now, that's not the only 
line going around. So the Guardian reported something slightly different. They say this, Downing Street sources claim the move was at the behest of Jeremy Hunt, who was taken over control of the government's economic response following Truss's disastrous mini budget, but who they claimed was now pulling the strings. So I say slightly different. That's not inconsistent with the idea that it was about migration. Jeremy Hunt presumably um, wants to change the results of you know the OBR forecasts. And one of the ways to do that is by changing migration policy. So maybe it was about that. But what's what's clear here is that this wasn't a Liz Truss decision, or at least according to The Guardian, this was from Jeremy Hunt. What is clear, what everyone seems to agree, is that no one is buying the national security excuse. So that this was just an honest mistake and she had to resign because the ministerial code had been breached. So the ITV's uh, political editor, Robert Peston, said this, as I understand it, the security breach by Suella Bradman was to use the wrong drop-down option on her mobile phone to send a non-sensitive email to another MP urging the MP to support government policy. So her supporters are saying this was an honest and trivial error. So it doesn't seem like a particularly big deal, a big security breach. So probably something more political going on, perhaps. Dominic Cummings also has a similar interpretation. So he says, given government docs, including official sensitive ones, are routinely circulated by top number 10 and cabinet office officials by Gmail and WhatsApp daily, the idea that sending a draft written ministerial statement via Gmail is a sacking or resignation offence, well, that's laughable. Clearly fired by the prime minister, or, or and or, I suppose you could say, hunt. Um, there's also speculation Bradman's ousting won't be the last. So the Daily Express reported this before um, she was booted out of the job. So they wrote, senior Tory MPs have told the Express it is now common knowledge that Mr Hunt is organising a reshuffle of Miss Truss's ministerial team. While the Prime Minister has to agree the moves, many fear she is now too weak to say no. One minister said, quote, she is so weak now that she will do everything Jeremy Hunt tells her so. Bloomberg's Alex Wickham, in fact, reports that, quote, number 10 has put several cabinet ministers on resignation watch. Whatever the reason for the departure, Braverman's resignation continues the government's habit for record breaking. At 43 days in the job, she has become the shortest serving Home Secretary since 1945. Only a Home Secretary from a caretaker administration comes close. And Braverman's resignation might bring about a distinct change in the attitudes of the Home Office. She was the paradigmatic culture warrior in government. Indeed, this was her only yesterday. Had opposition members of the other place not blocked these measures when they were in the police uh, crime sentencing and courts bill, the police would have had many of the powers contained in this bill and the British people would not have been put through this grief today. So yes, I'm afraid, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's the Labour Party, it's the Lib Dems, it's the Coalition of Chaos, it's the Guardian reading, to tofu eating, woke karate, dare I say, the anti-growth coalition that we have to thank for the disruption that we are seeing on our roads today. That was Brabham. And then in one of the highest offices of state, railing against the tofu-eating wokarati, it was in a debate on the public order bill. Now contrast that with her successor, so Grant Shapp, speaking during the Tory leadership election. Some of your rivals are talking quite a lot about the war on woke. Do you think that's not actually where people's heads are at? Well, if, if people want a sort of uh, a, a PM who's talking about sort of the war on woke well, or woke issues at all, it's just not me. Don't vote for me. I, I am interested in the bread and butter issues that your viewers would be thinking about every single day of the week. Uh, I, I am a libertarian. I'm, I'm liberal both um, economically, but also socially. Let, be, let them let live. Let people live their lives. I just don't think we need to get caught up in some US style, you know, debate and sort of almost sort of aggressive war uh, on these issues. It's just not necessary. Dahlia, I have two related questions for you. So why do you think um, that Braverman has resigned and been replaced by Shaps? And should we be breathing a sigh of relief that the pretty odious by all accounts, Braverman is out of office and replaced by someone who doesn't seem quite as keen on the culture wars? I mean, I'm afraid in a shocking turn of events, I actually have to agree with Swella Braverman that tofu is actually gross and should be banned. I don't like it's just disgusting. Anyway, um, I think the reasons that are being given uh, are obviously, as is often the case in politics, not the actual reasons why uh, this shuffle has happened. I think the most likely answer to me is probably that we've actually scraped the Tory barrel so far uh, that we've actually reached the point of Jeremy Hunt being uh, 
pretty much the prime minister in, in practice. I think that this is Jeremy Hunt exercising his power and, you know, using the fact that Liz Truss is so weak to basically position himself as having prime ministerial type powers. And it's a, a signal within the Conservative Party of, of who is now um, in charge. Uh, when it comes to Swella Braverman uh, leaving office, I mean, I will always celebrate um, the downfall of a Tory, especially one as rapidly invested in in stoking up the most kind of toxic and racist and horrendous uh, culture war possible. Uh, I think it's important to note, note that like everyone in the Conservative Party pretty much is invested in, you know, building a violent immigration system uh, in, you know, creating culture wars. That's how the Conservative Party has always um, asserted its power in the cultural sphere in particular. Braverman just comes from a wing of the party that is especially uh, obsessed with that kind of above all else. You know, I think for other Tory politicians, it's kind of one of many factors. For someone like a Suella Braverman or a Priti Patel or a Nadine Dorries, it's like, yeah, it's like a dog with a bone. It's like the only thing they care about. Um, but ultimately, you know, a lot of the, you know, even though Braverman was only there for five minutes, she still managed to do a considerable uh, amount of damage. You know, just before she left, uh, we saw the passing of the public order bill, um, which severely curtails our right to protest. And obviously, it's not a coincidence that just as the government is doing more and more things that require protesting, that's when they're going to crack down on people's uh, right to, to resist. Uh, particularly worrying about that bill is the amount of preemptive policing powers it gives. So giving the police the ability to, uh, you know, monitor and track people even before they have, you know, committed a crime or, or do, even done anything, just people who are, you know, it gives greater power to surveil those who are suspected of at some point possibly uh, doing something. So, you know, these are the kinds of preemptive surveillance powers that are, you know, it, it, it's authoritarian by by any stretch of the imagination. You simply can't call yourself uh, a democratic country if you operate with those kinds of, um, if you give the, the state that kind of um, power. And, you know, Braverman passed the bill, but it's backed by the whole Tory party, um, including Grant Shapps. Um, so, you know, even, even though he's kind of being portrayed as kind of a bit more moderate by the press, Really, when it comes to the, to the bones of the issues, he is on the same page uh, as as Braverman. What we're going to see, maybe less of, is that kind of um, rabid public posturing, the kind of clownish public statements about the woke karate. We might see a bit less of that. Um, don't hold me to that though, because whenever the Tories are in a bit of a sticky situation, that's kind of the only that's the first thing they they go to. But I think kind of on the, the meat and bones of the issue, I'm not sure that there's too much to celebrate because so much damage has has already been done. Uh, and I think that we will see continuity between home secretaries. And what worries me even more is that I don't have complete faith that a future Starmer government would actually roll back on some of these massive violations um, of, our, of our civil rights. So it's really important to remember that on a policy level, um, a lot of Breverman's most destructive, you know, the most destructive parts of her tenure are still in place. Um, we've got some more breaking news and more breaking U-turns. So this one's a little bit complex. Um, it involves parliamentary wrangling. So what happened today um, was the Labour Party put forward an opposition day motion. And what their motion said was that they want to create parliamentary time so that there can be a vote on whether or not to ban Fracking. Now, they thought this was necessary because the Tories are reversing their manifesto pledge to um, stop fracking. That's why they were going to do this. It was expected that lots of Tory MPs would vote with Labour. The Tory leadership was so worried about losing this that they said this would be a confidence vote. So anyone who voted with Labour would lose the whip. So you could have seen a big exodus from the Tory party, essentially. People thought this was very, very high stakes given the circumstances. Now, the U-turn, actually, before I go to the U-turn, let's let's read one uh, so I can prove to you um, that they had 
called this a free line whip. So this is from Craig Whitaker, the Tory chief whip. This is a message he sent earlier to Tory MPs. The second debate is the main event today. So that's the one about fracking. And it is a hard line, 100% free line whip. This is not a motion on fracking. This is a confidence motion in the government. We cannot, under any circumstances, let the Labour Party take control of the order paper and put through their own legislation and whatever other bits of legislation they desire. We are voting no. And I reiterate, this is a hard two-line whip. So he changes halfway through his message. It's a little bit confusing. I know this is difficult for some colleagues, but we simply cannot allow this. Um, so by calling this a, a free-line whip and saying it's a confidence motion, so that's what's really key here, saying it's a confidence motion, if you vote against it or if you don't vote in line with the whip, you can lose your whip. You're no longer a Tory MP. What happened in the afternoon is that it became clear that some MPs were still going to vote with Labour. So this is from Chris Skidmore. He is a former energy minister and is actually currently in charge of a review on net zero for Liz Truss. So he said this today, as the former energy minister who signed net zero into law for the sake of our environment and climate, I cannot personally vote tonight to support fracking and undermine the pledges I made at the 2019 general election. So they obviously pledged um, that they wouldn't frack then. And he says, I am prepared to face the consequences of my decision. So that's clearly a reference. I am prepared to lose the whip if it means not going against the 2019 Tory manifesto. Now, I'll read for you word for word a tweet from Robert Peston sent uh, two minutes before we go live. So he said, government announces the fracking vote is no longer a confidence vote because of the scale of the expected rebellion by Tory MPs. Trust could not afford to expel them. It is no longer clear what authority she has over her party. Extraordinary. And he says, yes, in brackets, yawn, another U-turn. Um, now, we are still waiting for the results of that vote to come in. That should be any moment now. So we can see the scale of the rebellion. But even before we find out those results, what's pretty clear here um, is that, yeah, we, we can't go literally 10 minutes without another U-turn from Liz Truss. Um, I want your take on this, Dahlia, with the proviso that I might um, rudely interrupt you um, as we go to the results. So, I mean, what, what do you think this means that even... In a four-hour period, they've gone from this is a confidence vote to actually know you can vote with Labour if you want. The chief whip you turned in the middle of his statement. He was like, first it's a three-line whip, now it's a two-line whip. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that this is, I think in this particular moment, what you what he shouldn't have done, what Liz Truss shouldn't have done is say that this was a confidence vote in her, because I think what that actually probably did is inspire more rebellion <laughs> than actually would have happened in the first place. Because I think, especially those Tory backbenchers, uh, even the ones that, you know, would have backed her um, in, the, in the leadership contest are probably itching to make a public show that they do not support the prime minister, not just because they are potentially leading her they're potentially going to be led into, you know, a catastrophic election under her uh, leadership, but because they want to signal to their own constituencies, particularly in that red wall, where, you know, the impacts of this crisis, the impacts of the cost of living is going to be incredibly tough. Um, they probably want to signal to their constituencies that if constituents, that if it does come to an election, which it you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't take it off the table, that they have distanced themselves enough from this deeply unpopular leader uh, in order to have a shot of, of retaining um, their, their seat. So I think it's it shows uh, the extent to which Liz Truss is seen as a liability within More the party. News, I want that as well. And oh, there we go. Sorry, D Dahlia, what, I, just, just I was going to interrupt you for the results. <laughs> I also want to interrupt you because we've got some more breaking news. So this oh is God. from Noah Hoffman it's at The Sun. Now. The Tory chief whip has now gone. The Tory chief whip has resigned. Let's go to the results now. Order, order. The eyes to the right, 230. The nose to the left, 326. So the nose have it. The nose have it. Unlock. Uh, point, point of order, Tangham Debonair. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. So the government won that vote. Um, false alarm there. But they seem to have lost their Tory chief whip in the process. Which is, that's a very senior role. Um, so if they've lost the chief whip out of, I suppose, maybe he was embarrassed or she, I think it is a she actually, isn't it? Maybe she was embarrassed, the Tory chief whip, that she had to, um, you know, tell people at 2 p.m. that this was a confidence motion and then at 6 p.m. not do. I just want to read out one more tweet. It's from Jack Blanchard, who's at um, 
Bloomberg or Politico, Politico. He says, backbench Tory MPs going nuts in the Commons chamber as minister unable to say whether they'll be sacked for refusing to support the government on fracking tonight. So no one knows what the hell is going on. So will it be cold comfort to the Tories that they have um, successfully won this vote? There will, there will not be a vote uh, in the coming days on whether to ban fracking. So let me get this right. So the ban on fracking is not happening? Labour were putting forward a motion to say, let's have some time in the order paper. Let's have some time set aside so we can vote on whether to ban fracking. And that opposition motion has been voted down by the government. Now, the government was so worried they were going to lose that, that they made it a confidence motion. Then, they've, then they didn't want to lose the MPs. So they you turned on that, but they won the vote anyway. So essentially, they should have never made this a confidence motion. Although it is you know, potentially the case that not all of them got the message in time. And so some of them voted with the government instead of voting with Labour because they still thought they'd lose their jobs if they didn't do that. I mean, it's a mess, I think, in summary. Um, but yeah, I mean, I suppose if we still think this is a government that has policies, the, the, the practical outcome here is that fracking is not going to be banned. So presumably, Liz Truss's policy of restarting fracking will still go ahead. I don't know if how long it takes to start a um, fracking project. If you can do that um, between now and Liz Truss resigns, I've got no idea. Uh, do you think we should be worried about the environmental implications of this data or do you think that that's a little bit of a, a moot point considering that this government can't, you know, even uh, their U-turn every four hours? I mean, so what you're essentially saying is in the midst of Westminster scrambling and incompetency that everyday people, their ecological environment, their environmental surroundings, you know, their water supply and all of the kind of risks of fracking. And also not to mention the broad meta risks um, of the fact that fracking is bad, you know, is contributes to, to global warming, that basically people and planet are suffering as a result of these, you know, petty, ridiculous, incompetent Westminster games. Yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds like pretty much what I would expect of this government. I agree with you. You know, there is some, there is serious damage being done. I, but I think the silver lining potentially is, you know, if I was an investor and I was saying, should I start a fracking project? Then if I knew that the government in favor of fracking were this week, I would not invest any money in that. No, that would be a terrible business decision. If you don't know if the prime minister is going to be the same one from now to the next day, and if you know that the opposition who are likely to win the next general election aren't particularly in favour of fracking, then I'm wondering if this is going to end up being a bit more symbolic than practical. Um, but obviously they are, you know, this is a serious issue which is now being reduced to just a, you know, a, a ball to kick about in parliamentary games. Ian Murray MP, Labour MP tweets, I've never seen scenes like it at the entrance to a voting lobby. Tories on open warfare, jostling and re-smog shouting at his colleagues, whips screaming at Tories. <laughs> they, they, they are done and should call a general election. And he says, two Tory whips dragging people in. He says, it's shocking. Of course, this is a Labour MP, you know, he's not exactly a neutral observer, but I don't think, you know, uh, it's not only people with a political agenda who are saying that it's absolutely chaos inside the Conservative Party right now. Um, and this is all this is all what happened in about the last four hours. So let's go a little bit earlier today because it was dramatic from the very beginning. Um, let's take a look at today's PMQs. Mr Speaker, those spending cuts are on the table for one reason and one reason only, because they crashed the economy. <laughs> Working, working people, working people are going to have to pay 500 quid more a month on their mortgages. And what's the Prime Minister's response to say she's sorry? What does she think people will think and say? That's all right, I don't mind financial ruin, at least she apologised. Yeah. Prime Minister. I do think there has to be some reflection of economic reality from the party <laughs> Interest rates, interest rates are rising across the world and the economic conditions have worsened. And we are being honest 
we're levelling with the public, unlike the honourable gentleman who simply won't do it. And what is the honourable gentleman doing about the fact that workers, train workers, are again going on strike? The fact is he refuses to condemn the workers. We are bringing forward policies. Mr Speaker, we are bringing forward policies that are going to make sure our railways are protected, people going to work are protected. He backs the strikers, we back the strivers. Mr Speaker, she's asking me questions because we're a government in waiting and they're an opposition, they're an opposition in waiting. I always enjoy just watching the faces of the people standing behind Truss whenever she speaks now because they're all just so miserable. Like Jeremy Hunt managed a sort of small nod when it came to that sort of bizarre attack on strikers, which I don't think anyone is going to buy. I think actually it works in the RMT's favour every time Liz Truss changes the subject to them because it just makes everyone read, oh, is that what this is really about? Is When the Tories, you know, shout all this nonsense about strikers is this just them trying to distract from their terrible economic policies now that was you know that used to be a left-wing argument to make that's now the most obvious interpretation of anything Liz Truss says whenever she speaks in public now things only got worse for her though let's have a look Mr Speaker, the only mandate she's ever had is from members opposite. Yeah. Yeah. It was a mandate built on fantasy economics yeah. and it ended in disaster. Yeah. Yeah. The country's got nothing to show for it except the destruction of the economy yeah. and the implosion of the Tory party. Yeah. I've got the list here. 45p tax cut, gone. Yeah. Corporation tax cut, Gone. 20p tax cut, gone. Two year energy freeze, gone. Tax free shopping, gone. Economic credibility, gone. And her supposed best friend, the former Chancellor, he's gone as well. They're all gone. So why is she still here? Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I am a fighter and not a quitter. <laughs> she is a fighter, not a quitter. Let's replay that in two weeks' time. I'm sure that is going to be the start of a Tisky Sour soon when she has, you know, inevitably, well, I say done the decent thing and quit, I suppose, um, conceded that the inevitable was going to happen at some point. Now, it wasn't all bun fights at PMQs. We learned some things too. Let's have a look at what Truss had to say about pensions and benefits. Can the Prime Minister perhaps turn to our Chancellor right now, get permission to make another U-turn and commit to raising the state pension at the rate of inflation? Yeah. Prime Minister. I honestly don't know what the Honourable Gentleman is talking about because... clear in our manifesto that we will maintain the triple lock and I am completely committed to it, so is the Chancellor. Mr Speaker, millions of family carers have been forced to cut back on food and heating. One told Carers UK, my son is incontinent. If we don't wash him in warm water several times a day, this will cause him to physically decline. So how do we pay for the gas to heat the water if we are currently at max budget? But all people and carers are struggling enough already in this cost of living crisis, Mr Speaker. So will the Prime Minister guarantee that support for the vulnerable, including carers allowance, will rise by at least today's inflation rate of 10.1%? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. People are struggling. It is difficult at the moment. That's why we put in place the energy price guarantee to make sure the typical household isn't paying more than £2,500. It's why we've supplied an extra £1,200 of support to the most vulnerable. And I can assure the Right Honourable Gentleman, we will always support the most vulnerable. They will be our priority. Recent events meant that spending is going to be more constrained than originally thought. May I encourage the Prime Minister to ensure that we retain compassion in politics in these decisions, including maintaining the link between in benefits and inflation. Will she do that? Prime Minister. We are, we are compassionate Conservatives. We will always, we will always, work, we will always work to 
protect the most vulnerable and that is what we did with the energy price guarantee. We are going to make sure the most vulnerable are protected into year two and I'm sure the Chancellor has heard my honourable friend's representations on the contents of the medium term fiscal plan. So that's a solid commitment to the pensions triple lock. Now that was seen as somewhat of a U-turn because it had briefed that that triple lock might go. So the triple lock being that pensions will rise either by 2.5% by inflation or by earnings. We thought maybe they were going to get rid of that. No, Liz Truss has committed to that. But there was no answer about uprating other benefits in line with inflation. So that could mean a real terms cut to universal credit and other allowances. Now, that distinction makes no sense. This graph from the Resolution Foundation shows how household disposable income of working age people is predicted to be hit um, by the economic downturn ahead. So the blue bar is how much poorer people will be if benefits are uprated by inflation. Now, the additional red bits are how much poorer people will be if they're only uprated by earnings. As you can see, even if benefits are uprated, as usual, so in line um, with inflation, the poorest 5% of the public will still be 13% poorer next year than they were this year. And if benefits are increased only by the lower rate in line with earnings, they'll be 16% poorer. So those are huge, huge losses. And you do have to ask, why do these people get ignored while pensioners get protected? Now, I think the triple lock should stay. The reason it was introduced, in fact, was because pensions in this country are relatively low compared to other countries. It's good. It's there. But what possible reason is there to protect pensioners' incomes, but not people of working age who are in poverty and in desperate poverty? Now, for me, the only reason I can come up with, the only way I can possibly make sense of this, is that poor working age people don't tend to vote for the Conservative Party, you know, so they can be ignored. Pensioners tend to vote for the Conservative Party. And we've seen this over and over again, actually. And again, this is not to try and create resentment among voting groups is to sort of point out the cynicism of the Conservative Party, because I think we've seen it with mortgages and renters. When it was the case that a mini budget um, increased interest rates and so would damage mortgage holders, that was a political crisis within the Conservative Party. They had to get rid of their chancellor because they were terrified about losing people with mortgages. When rents went up by 12, 25%, I mean, they've been going up by an enormous amount in London. Mine went up by 15%. Nothing. And that's because renters don't vote for the Conservatives. So renters don't vote for the Conservatives. Working age people on benefits don't vote for the Conservatives. We don't get protected. Mortgage holders more likely to vote for the Conservatives. Pensioners very likely to vote for the Conservatives. They get protected. As I say, I'm not trying to create division between these people. There are lots of struggling pensioners and lots of struggling mortgage holders. But I think the cynicism of the Conservatives here is plain for all to see. Now, getting back to the hustle and bustle of Westminster and the issue of Liz Truss's future, the big question has been and still remains, is Truss doing enough to win her MPs around? Because the fact is, the Tories are coming for her. So Dan Hodges tweeted this today. So he says, understand Liz Truss has been informed by Graham Brady, the traditional threshold of letters for a leadership challenge has been breached, but he is insisting on a threshold of half the parliamentary party before acting. So Graham Brady chairs the 1922 Committee of Backbenchers. If he receives letters from 15% of Tory MPs, that would normally prompt a confidence vote. But according to the Tory party rules, Liz Truss should have a 12-month grace period. So it should be too soon for quite a long time. According to Dan Hodges, though, if half the parliamentary party send in letters, he might think about changing those rules. That's the chair of the 19. 22 committee changed those rules, not Dan Hodges. Obviously, he doesn't have that power. Um, Dahlia, given all of this, how long um, do you give Liz Truss? What would it take for 50% of Conservative MPs to send in their letters to Graham Brady and prompt some kind of response from him? I got to tell you, that, that lettuce is looking pretty vivacious uh, right now in comparison to Liz Truss. It looks full of life. Um, I mean, she's she's a goner. I, 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 she, she's literally popular with nobody. With no, she doesn't have a constituency now. Um, you know, she's unpopular with the public. She's unpopular with her party. She's even unpopular with you know neoliberal institutions that always love a conservative party. Institutions like the IMF. Um, you know, she's unpopular with the markets. Her her power is is completely. Um, untenable, and I and I don't think that she 
can claw it back now. I think she's completely isolated. The fact that she is kind of completely uh, divested, it seems divested um, from the, the her position and has kind of handed de facto power to Jeremy Hunt kind of shows that. Um, the question now is, uh, and whether or not, you know, 50% of Tories would hand in their, their, their letters of no confidence, I think it comes down to how will the Tories find a way of removing her as prime minister without having to call uh, an election. Obviously, we don't have any kind of constitutional rules on something like this, but it is completely unprecedented um, for a party to go through this number of leaders and, you know, and not call call an election. Um, I don't know who who will take the reins over um, of this sinking ship and how exactly they would get away with it, given the number of of prime ministers we've already um, conservative leaders we, we've already we've already been through. Um, I kind of think, and I think that these fantasies of sort of Tory backbenchers, you know, sacrificing their careers for the good of the country, and you know, voting, um, sending in these letters, even if it means a general election, and even if it meant risking their seats, um, especially in those those in the the red wall. I think that's just kind of like a, a really naive liberal uh, fantasy. I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, I think you'll have to claw power from their cold, dead hands. Um, so, so I think that that really at the moment, what's probably happening um, in the upper echelons of the Conservative Party is figuring out how do we get rid of Liz Truss without ha- being pushed into calling um, an election. And once they've figured that out, I'm sure they will... Uh, go ahead with whatever is needed in order um, to do that. But essentially, now is the time for the labor movement to quite literally strike while it's hot, you know, um, while the iron is hot. There is, the government is in a uniquely weak position, um, and it is the labor movement that has the power to make their ability to govern untenable um, and to force them into a position um, of a general election, because I don't think that power is going to be conceded here by conservative MPs. I think it will have to be uh, taken from them. And I just hope that the Labour Party um, would find it within themselves to support that movement on the ground um, rather than undercutting them uh, at every opportunity. Uh, so for what I, from what I can see, um, the main thing that the Tories will want to be doing is avoiding any way, any point at which they'd have to call an election. And so it's up to, you know, the Labour movement, people on the ground um, to really push for that to happen, because it is unacceptable now um, that we have gone through this many conservative leaders, conservative um, prime ministers without having um, an election. So if they're not going to, to do that, I think we have to force it on them. We've got some more breaking news for you. So my apologies, first of all, I think we refer to Craig Whitaker as the chief whip. He's in fact the deputy chief whip. The chief whip is Wendy Morton, or at least the chief whip up until today was Wendy Morton because it is being reported. Um, So when I told you the chief whip has resigned or it's been reported, that was Wendy Morton. But now it's also being reported that the deputy chief whip, who is Craig Whitaker, has also resigned. And then we've got a very colourful tweet from the spectators, Isabel Harmon. So she says this... Craig Whitaker has just come out of the lobby and said, quote, I am fucking furious that I don't give a fuck anymore, <laughs> which, which, to be fair, does sound like the kind of words of someone who is about to resign and potentially the words of someone who was told at you know 2 p.m. or whatever to tell everyone that a confidence vote was coming up. And if they voted against a motion, they would be kicked out of the party and who then had to, I suppose, tell them that actually they wouldn't be. Or I mean, what, what, what seems to be the case if you add up all these stories together is he even though he was a deputy chief whip, had no idea what was going on and what he was supposed to tell MPs. We've become used to hearing about the £45 billion in unfunded tax cuts that were being promised by Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. When they were first announced, it was said the government would have to find a corresponding £45 billion in spending cuts to keep the books balanced and the markets happy. That meant that when the majority of those tax cuts were dropped, people breathed an initial sigh of relief. Perhaps without the tax cuts, we wouldn't need spending cuts at all. But that's not the message being delivered by the Tories or by the BBC. Take a look at this explainer from Faisal Islam. It's not just a new chapter in economic policy, a complete rewrite. Actually, the biggest U-turn in British economic history. 
Let's look at how the mini budget funding gap has changed. We start with the 45 billion of unfunded tax cuts announced at the mini budget. The biggest single one, corporation tax, gone on Friday, worth 19 billion pounds a year. And even before that, the scrapping of the 45p rate was itself scrapped. Gone raising two billion pounds. Today, another seven billion in other tax cuts were scrapped, including things like a freeze on alcohol duty. Bye to that, leaving a 17 billion pound gap to fund. That is the stamp duty cut and the reversal of the rise in national insurance. Here to stay. But then on income tax, Jeremy Hunt went even further than a mini budget U turn, not only cancelling the cut in basic rate income tax that's gone next year, but getting rid of it into the future. That raises £5 billion a year, but incredibly leaves the self-proclaimed tax-cutting PM with a higher path for the basic rate of income tax than she inherited, partly due to that recent turmoil. Add all that, and she still leaves a hole of £12 billion. But look at this, the gap has actually grown by £20 billion, at least because the economy has been hit and we face higher interest rates, and not just because of the mini budget. And that all means a large gap remains despite today, 30-ish billion pounds. And so a squeeze on public spending, hard-pressed departments, perhaps big railway projects, welfare, even pension payments, nothing's off the table, we're told. So you saw that after various U-turns, the total changes to taxes so far have created a back of 12, a gap, sorry, of 12 billion pounds compared to when Liz Truss came to power. But then all of a sudden, at the end of that clip, because of changes to the economic environment, that gap jumps to £30 billion. And the day after Faisal Islam delivered that report on the BBC, a piece on their website raised the figure. So they raised the figure that would need to be saved. So it got larger. Um, so as you can see here, so it's in a report, sorry, titled Warning of a Scary Spending Cuts After Tax U-Turns. The BBC included this graphic. So it says, how much of the £72 billion black holes, so we're now on £72 billion, in the government's finances has been filled? And then they show you the policies, the U-turns which have happened and, and the extent to which that's filled the black hole. So corporation tax um, filled the black hole by £18 billion. The basic rate of income tax U-turn filled it by £5.9 billion. You've got some other taxes here. But essentially the takeaway here is the estimated shortfall so the black hole to be filled is £39.7 billion. So where has this £39 billion black hole come from? And do we really need to fill it? I spoke to Joe Michelle, Associate Professor in Economics at the University of the West of England. So as you say, you might have been forgiven for thinking that the government tried to cut taxes by £45 billion and then almost entirely ripped up its plans and said it wasn't going to do that. So why hasn't the problem gone away again. There are three elements, I think, to why it hasn't gone away again. The first element is that they haven't completely ripped up their plans. They haven't taken away the national uh, insurance um, cut, and they haven't taken away um, stamp duty, for example. You've got to keep the housing market going in this country, as you know. So that's number one. Um, I think there's about 15, 20 billion worth still in there. The second thing is that the mess generated as a result of the budget and all of the bond market reaction has raised the rate of interest on government debt. So over the next three years, we're going to be paying higher interest. So that adds to the government's cost. So there's a cost which didn't exist before, which is interest payments, as a result of the, the mess of the last few weeks. Now, why do I say three years? That's because the final piece, and this, I think, is the least um, reasonable piece, I and mean, they're all unreasonable, but the least reasonable piece is that the thing is artificially being benchmarked to a target of falling debt as a share of national income in three years' time. So there's an arbitrary target, which was actually selected by the government, by Kwarteng and Truss, and everything is being compared to that. So even before the, the crazy budget, there was a so-called black hole on that measure, on that target. So they, they added to the black hole, then they backed off, but interest rates got higher. And I would say that I think these kind of arbitrary targets, particularly in terms of things like debt to GDP ratio, are really meaningless and shouldn't be um, part of policymaking. So we should, we should resist them. 
I suppose you're saying it's imaginary, it's arbitrary, it doesn't you know, exist in, in nature, it's based on a target which was made by policymakers, which media personalities are now making seem you know, a bit more objective than it might really be. I suppose you could say in response, look, what the last couple of weeks have taught us is that reducing the debt, um, not being overly profligate when it comes to spending, does matter. We are now terrified of terrifying the markets or spooking the markets, and so this money does need to be saved somewhere. Say, for example, the left argue you should be dumping that target of making the debt fall compared to GDP by three years. We say that's arbitrary. What if the government dumps that and then the markets say, oh, we don't like that, we're spooked again? Then what happens? So I think there's two bits to this. One is, do we need to care at all about the deficit and the debt uh, and have some sort of policy aim of, of not letting them get out of hand? And my answer would be yes, that these aren't things that you can just um, completely ignore. But I think we're in quite a dangerous place at the moment because the market reaction to the, the Kwarteng budget is now being used, as we've seen, to justify austerity. The Osborne um, crowd, including Rupert Harrison, who was Osborne's advisor, who's just been appointed advisor by Hunt, I think that's a, a, sim a deliberately symbolic um, piece of appointment there, uh, have really got the wind in their sails. They're saying, look, this shows we were right all along. You can't play silly games with the bond markets. We were right to impose austerity from 2010. We were right to cut government spending. Uh, and now we need to do it all again. And I think that's exactly the wrong conclusion to draw from the last few weeks. We do need to care about government debt to GDP. It isn't a completely... Well, let, me, let me take that back, actually. We do need to care about the public finances. We need to care about how much the government is spending compared to how much it taxes for a range of reasons. I mean, one reason is that, that just determines how much overall spending there is in the economy, and that could contribute to inflation or it could contribute to you know, weak demand. We do need, I think, to care about the extent to which bond investors want to hold UK government debt, particularly because many bondholders holders of UK government debt are overseas. Unfortunately, about a third of our debt is held by foreign investors. We've got a big external trade deficit. So while I think it's very unlikely that we could see um, a default, our government actually saying, sorry, we're not going to pay you back. We can't afford it. We haven't got any money. It isn't going to happen. I think it, where, where you would see a constraint is the exchange rate. If we really tried to run really big deficits without any sort of um, plan, let the debt to GDP ratio just grow without limit um, and had a sense that the, the economy wasn't being well managed, then I think um, the ultimate place you would see it is in the exchange rate. People would start dumping the pound and that would mean imports getting more expensive and it would mean inflationary pressure. Bank of England would intervene further to raise rates. So I think you can get into a mess with this stuff. But I think the constraint is much less binding than people are suggesting. And a three year target debt to GDP target, I think, is just is, is silly. It's a, it's a silly target. You don't think we can just borrow with gay abandon. You do think sort of that the public finances matter. As we've put forward, though, I mean, the BBC, the media, they do seem to be taking this 30 to 40 billion pound black hole very seriously. Do you think they're quite plainly doing the ideological work of the Conservative Party and of um, these austerians who have now been appointed to these advisory bodies within the Treasury? Good question. I think there's a combination of ideology and perhaps more importantly, at least in some cases, uh, ignorance. I think a lot of journalists just don't feel confident that they know enough about this to, to take a different view to the conventional view. So they fall back on quoting the Institute for Fiscal Studies or the Office for Budget Responsibility, which appear to be reputable organizations that know what they're talking about. It's also the need for a headline. I mean, 30 billion black hole generates a headline. It generates clicks. I suppose it's more interesting than, you know, public finances are not doing very much today. It's not very interesting or, or something along these lines. Um, I would say that, for example, BBC journalist Andrew Verity has been quite good. He's done some quite clear explainers where he explains that, for example, the Bank of England can intervene in the bond markets and can therefore affect um, the rate of interest on government debt and can allow the government to smoothly issue debt without causing market volatility, exactly what the bank has been doing similar operations to over the last few weeks and over a lo the longer term, as, as it's called, quantitative easing. So I think there's a mixture um, of ignorance and possible ideology. One thing that's been interesting the last few weeks 
is to see the Conservative Party itself and bits of the press following it drop that sort of narrative that we need to be scared of the bond market narrative and try to move into we can just ignore the whole thing um, space. Uh, but I do think it's very dangerous to draw the wrong conclusions from um, the big mess of, of the Bank of England versus the bond markets versus the government and, and effectively the government chickening out first. Do you think any spending cuts are necessary at this time? I mean, everyone seems to accept that these are difficult economic times. Is it the case that any government would have to make some cuts to spending? I don't think so. I don't think there's any real justification for spending cuts at this um, time. I think a combination of sensible taxation, there's a whole bunch of places you can you can apply taxes that haven't been taxed yet. Um, Aaron Advani at the London School of Economics, for example, has highlighted a whole bunch of places you could get another 10, 20, 30 billion per year from things like um, equalizing dividend tax rates with uh, wage labor tax rates. If you receive profits effectively from owning corporations, you pay a lower tax rate than, than if you are a wage earner, capital gains, different pensions treatment for those on higher incomes. There's some really low hanging fruits out there, I think. If, if what you're worried about is the tax take. Um, if you're worried about the bond markets, I think the Bank of England could and should make sure the government can finance itself. That one's a bit more tricky because really it requires a new mandate from, from the government. Um, but in the short run, I would have thought it could kind of fudge its, its way through. Um, so I think the idea that we need spending cuts now, particularly three weeks ago, nobody seemed to be talking about spending cuts, though, though it was there by stealth, of course. There were government budgets weren't going to be increased in line with inflation. So there were sort of stealth cuts, I think, three weeks ago. But now it's right out in the open um, sort of austerity agenda again. I think it should be resisted. I think we should just say no government cuts this time. That was Joe Michelle speaking to me earlier, Associate Professor in Economics at the University of the West of England. Um, we've got more updates for you. They're piling in thick and fast. It does sound like it is absolute carnage in Westminster right now. Lloyd Russell Moyle, Labour MP, tweets, just seen Tory whips manhandling a crying Tory MP into their lobby for fracking. You couldn't make this toxic stuff up. Nasty to see the Tories at work. If this is how they treat their MPs, spare a thought for the country. Um, Politics Home political editor Adam Payne says, I'm told Wendy Morton, this is, so this is the, she was the chief whip, walked into the corridor shouting, quote, I'm no longer the chief whip. That was moments before the fracking vote took place. And that was with Liz Truss just metres away. Um, Tim Shipman has tweeted, I've been doing this job for 21 years. I've written millions of words about the last six years in which British politics descended into psychodramatic crack, into a psychodramatic crack dream. Today may, may be the most batshit day of the lot. Um, and apparently 40 Tories didn't vote with the government, including Kwasi Kwarteng. And it seems from the website, including Liz Truss, though I think we we need to get some confirmation about exactly what was going on there, because it'd be difficult to explain why she didn't. And it doesn't seem like many people are picking up on this. So I'm not I'm not sure if we've missed something, but it, on the website, at least it seems um, Liz Truss didn't. Paul Scully is a Tory minister in the Department of Leveling Up. And in a recent town hall style debate on the BBC, he got a bollocking from a lady in Sunderland. Do you not actually feel ashamed that I seen a segment on the news last night and a 65-year-old woman was crying because she couldn't use a toaster. That lady over there has just been crying about the cost of living. Are you not ashamed of a party that our older generation are crying in fear of how they're going to survive and live? Are you not ashamed of that? Look, it's not about being ashamed. It's about trying to work out how I can act. I really hate the fact that there are people suffering the way that you've just described. Uh, I didn't see that piece. Um, and we've got to do something about it. We can't just sit there. You've been in power give, for twelve what, what, years. How can you do? How can you say we're trying to do something? You've been well, in because, power for twelve years. Kerry, what we haven't had in those twelve years, you know, in the lead up to those, we haven't had two years when we basically switched off the. We've had twelve economy. years of austerity. No, but we have. We, how but can we're you literally defend that? Turned, every single country in the world turned off their economy effectively for two years. We spent four hundred and eight. Can you just change the same drivel over and over again by blaming Ukraine and blaming Russia and blaming Covid? You have been in power for 12 years. 40% of children in the North East live in poverty. Are you not ashamed of that? No, Kerry, what I'm saying to you is that we're trying to act targeting our support towards those people. Now, having just <laughs> hot, hot, nearly half you a trillion... You need to be on a stage as a clown. You have not got a clue.
That was really, really refreshing to hear someone call out the Tories for always blaming someone else for the problems they created. The clip the lady is referring to is heart-wrenching, though. It was part of a report on ITV News. On dark pre-dawn streets illuminate the lights of those whose lives depend on hard work. How many days a week are you doing this? Five. Five days a week? Yeah. It's early. Every time this time of morning, early starts. Yeah, no, I've been here since about 20 past four. Liz Wright is 65 years old. She has known tough times before. You always worked? Yeah, I need to bring money in. But nothing quite like this, where her bills are too big to bear. Her wage as a cleaner barely buying the basics. Toilet rolls once a month. The next month it'll be the soap powder and the next month it'll be the coffee, yeah. where once upon a time you just went out and bought. On good weeks, Liz gets the bus into work. On bad weeks, she has to walk, unable to afford the daily £4 fare. Today, she has the money, but the good weeks occur less often now. We meet Liz after her shift. The big worry, keeping her awake at night, is her new energy bill, which has just doubled. You go in your account and it's £253 the one of a month. Can you afford that? Where am I going? Where do, where I can't know. Are you worried about any of this? Yeah, really worried. Yeah. I don't want to burden my family. My daughter comes once a fortnight for something to eat and she has to bring the food. What change have you already made to try and cook? I've changed everything. I don't use my cooker very often. I don't have a toaster because I always use my... Um, so it's a luxury to have a piece of toast. Really? Really. Is it food banks next? Will I be able to keep the house? Because then I'm going to have to explain that I've got no money and I can't live. We'll give you a second. Thanks. <laughs> it's just such a, I mean, a horrible situation. I mean, you've got someone 65, they're waking up really, really early to go to work, you know, working really hard. I think at that age, you, sh you know, you shouldn't have to have a job where you're waking up super early. If you've got a job, it should be part time. It should be, you know, you should be in your, well, I mean, I don't even, say, I don't even think you need to say you've earned the right to have a nicer time. But if anyone has, it is someone who is, who is of, of that age going to work hard. Now, after all of that, I don't think, you know, I think we should live in a society where no one of that age is forced to get up so early. You should have a job which is much, much more sociable, much more easygoing. But then even after that, she gets home and she can't afford to toast her, 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 her bread. It's just living in a society, a wealthy society, by the way, where that is going on. And by the way, that's also been going on for years. Right. I think it was important that the woman in that uh, response to Paul Scully said, you've been doing austerity for 12 years. This isn't just a Putin thing. This isn't just a gas crisis. This isn't just coronavirus. You have been doing this for 12 years. And stories like that, I mean, thank God they're on the news more than they have been. And I think it is probably the, set, the case that more people than ever are experiencing that. But there are people who have been choosing you know, between heating and eating ever since austerity really started kicking in you know you had people dying with empty stomachs right that was during the austerity years especially people getting um sanctioned um often for completely spurious reasons end up completely completely destitute but this situation here i mean i'm very very glad it is now being given the platform it deserves i think poverty was ignored and not only ignored but people in poverty were demonized for years in our press oh these are the skyvers you know the, uh, these are people who don't deserve anything now I was reading an interesting tweet, actually, that I think some poverty campaign has sort of started saying, let's stop talking about people on benefits, let's start talking about in-work poverty. Now, you might say, you know, it's a shame that they had to do that because people out of work deserve our, uh, you know, solidarity just as much as people in work. But it does seem like that reframing maybe has made a bit of a difference. I'm not sure. I mean, Dahlia, I want your take on this. I suppose a number of things to say. Obviously, this is you know, we can get carried away with these sort of Westminster wranglings. This is what really matters when it comes to Tory policy. But also, are you, you know, do you think you have noticed a change in how the media reports these things? Uh, I think, I mean, it's very difficult to say because, you know, the media is, is such a, is such a fickle, um, it's such a fickle thing. I think even if we have this one glimmer um, of that, you know, that woman, which I don't even know if, 
if they were aware that she was going to kind of bring up the fact that you can't just blame this on current crises, but actually that we have been living in this process of decaying the social safety net, of breaking it down, of, of, of getting people, of making it clear to people that they no longer should expect to have basic rights like housing, like food, like clean water guaranteed. Um, that's been happening for a really long time. But, you know, I have no, I'm not entirely sure that that we can say that that means that that will continue, um, that that kind of uh, shedding light on the impacts of austerity in that kind of, in a way that really affords people dignity um, will continue. I think also just when watching that clip, it's like when you think of the broader context of the fact that like BP literally tripled its profits um, in the last quarter, Shell has hit a record eleven billion dollars um, in profit. Uh, their profit, lit- their profits, literally doubled in the past year. So, what is in in whose name is is this happening? In in what name is this happening? And because at the same time, you have you know a sixty five year old woman. It's not only like having to get up at four in the morning to walk to a job that she shouldn't need to have. She should have a pension. She should be able to you know retire by that time. But also, you know, cleaning is back-breaking work. It is not something that someone who's 65 years old should be having to, to do. Um, and then coming home and, you know, not being able to, to spend money on a bus fare or to, to you know, have like, a ba- like basic things. Um, and then at the same time as that, you have the very Tory MPs that have enabled this system, that have architected this system, uh, stigmatizing people, you know, talking about people, you know, living lavishly on benefits and, you know, choosing to be poor because they're lazy. And, you know, all of these things are incredibly, you know, these are all processes that have always, that have been taking place for, for several years now, particularly accelerated under Tory austerity, but now have reached a real uh, climax. You know, I was walking through um, on in London the other day and I tweeted about this because I was just like, I just could not rid myself of like the absolute just like horror and like anger that I felt. Um, you know, I I obviously London is a city that is eye-wateringly wealthy. There is wealth in this city that is absolutely obscene. And at the same time, you know, I met an unhoused person who was literally crying in pain on the street because he had trench foot. Like trench foot is this is the 21st century. Trench foot is a disease that people suffered from in the trenches of the First World War, and we're seeing it on the streets of one of the wealthiest cities in the world. You know, it, it it's it, it it's. I don't understand. You know, when you talk about oh, we need to have these cuts or we need to spend government money better, whatever. I don't understand how anyone can look at the conditions that we see on the just just when you walk out of your of your home on the streets of this city and around the country and think that there is any slack left in the system um, to to cut in. And the final thing I want to say about that is, you know, obviously, like, you know, that man that I met, he was like visibly and vocally in a, in a deep amount of pain. And people were just like walking past him. And the reason is because people are used to it. We are used to seeing that level of suffering in our society and considering it to be something that is that is normal and you know not to get all kind of like woo woo and spiritual or whatever but i really think that that does like deep lasting damage to a society to to normalize people being able to to disembody themselves and kind of compartmentalize which i'm sure many people do as a defense strategy although i do think it's kind of inexcusable to walk past someone like that and to just not even ask them if they're okay but I imagine it's a defense strategy, but you have to kill something inside of yourself to be able to do that. And that is what we have collectively done as a society. And it's something that we've been pushed into doing um, as a result of this absolutely like morally bankrupt, disgusting government that we have had to endure um, for for the past 12 years. You know, there there is nothing that anyone can ever do to ever deserve um, living in the kind of indignity that we saw. that woman experiencing and that, you know, many of us see while walking the streets of this country every day. It really was the austerity project, wasn't it? To, to, to completely lower people's expectations of how civilized a society should be. 
So obviously you, you get into a situation and it's, it's really different between countries. So I imagine if you're in you know, Northern Europe, somewhere with a strong welfare state, if you see someone homeless, that's sort of surprising. You know, you, you wouldn't just walk past because you say, oh, what's going on here? If you're in LA or many parts of the United States, I'm sure it's completely, you know, no one bats an eyelid because that's very normal there. And I completely agree with you that on that spiritual level, it is quite, it's quite corrosive to live in a society where that becomes normalized. But it's also very, very useful for um, conservative governments, for right-wingers, for, you know, the oligarchs in the United States or wherever we're talking about, because the more we are willing to tolerate the suffering of poor people, you know, the more of their, you know, the lower taxes will be. Because if we are, if, if we are shocked by all of this, then there will be an overwhelming demand for higher taxes and for some proper redistribution. So long as they can make it seem normal that people are poor and suffering and, oh, that's just, that's just the way the life is. Maybe it's their fault, but maybe it's their fault and they're just skivers. Or maybe it's not their fault, but we have to take hard decisions um, because that's the only way we can have economic stability. That's the kind of arguments we get. Um, I have said this is, you know, these stories are more important than what's going on in Westminster. But in defense of Westminster stories, um, this is probably what's going to get this Tory party out of government. And it will matter if they are gone. So we will return um, to some updates about um, the conservative implosion. Nadine Dorries, I thought this tweet was quite interesting. Chris Bryant, talking utter attention so you can get me on the news nonsense to Sam Coates Sky. Um, when Labour in power, I saw Labour MPs hiding in the bottle bank on the terrace and being dragged out by Labour whips and frog marched into lobby to vote on Blair's education bill. Now, the context there is I think Chris Bryant was saying that Therese Coffey and Jacob Rees-Mogg were manhandling people into the lobby. Um, Nadine Dorries saying, that's normal. New Labour did that as well. Very uh, Nadine Dorries comment there. Um, Aubrey Allegretti from The Guardian. Tory MP Charles Walker lets loose. So apparently he says, I really shouldn't say this, but I hope all those people that put Liz Truss in number 10, I hope it was worth it. I hope it was worth it for the ministerial red box. I've had enough of talentless people. Liz Truss hasn't achieved much distinction since she became prime minister until now, because finally it turns out there's something she's the very best at, and that's being the worst. Polling from YouGov shows that Truss's favourability ratings stand at minus 70. That's the worst favourability rating of any party leader since polling began. She's a full 17 points below Boris Johnson's worst score and only 10 points more popular than Prince Andrew. But it's not just her own reputation that Truss has managed to completely trash. She's taking the entire Tory party with her. According to YouGov, 77% of Britons now disapprove of the government. That's the worst polling any government has had in 11 years of polling. Only 7% of the population approve of its record. Which is probably why the Tories are so desperate to get rid of her. More than half of all Conservative members think it's time for trust to go. And that includes more than a third of those members who actually voted for her. But bizarrely, more than half of the people who picked her for the job are sticking to their guns. They don't yet have buyer's remorse. And let's say, um, let's say she goes, who is likely to replace her? Well, we might see the return of Boris Johnson. According to YouGov, a third of Tory members want him back. The next po most popular runner, Rishi Sunak, trails behind him by almost 10 points. Though given what a mess they've made of it last time, it's unlikely that the Tory membership will get a say this time around. Um, uh, Dahlia, this polling full is trust. I mean, it's, I have to admit, I find it kind of hilarious. You know, like the interview she did with Chris Mason on Monday evening, just like watching it, like, I can't think of a more humiliating thing to happen to someone than to get the top job in the country, the most high profile job in the country and just be so clearly terrible at it. You know, it's not even like, she's not, I mean, she is hated, but more than that, she's just ridiculed. Like, she is just not up for this. Like, everyone knows it. There are only 11% of the public who think that maybe she <laughs> could do this job. Everyone else thinks this woman cannot do this job. Like, it is, it's humiliating. It's also a little bit hilarious, isn't it? I just don't think she'll ever be able to rid herself of, like, the loser stench um, that, like, has just, is just clinging to her right now. Um, I mean, if Boris Johnson comes back, like I'm, I'm done. Like I'm out. I can't, I can't anymore. Um, that that's would be absolutely absurd. But I'm not going to put anything past um, this Conservative uh, Party. 
I have to say, like being already being the most unpopular leader since polling began, like it's actually hard to overstate how much of a significant achievement that actually is. Like you have to be so impeccably uh, talented at being rubbish in order to get that. Like I'm almost quite impressed. She actually did. There's actually something that she's managed to excel at. Um, you know, not only is she so unpopular that she's managed to like counteract that that post-election bounce that new leaders uh, normally get, but her unpopularity even counteracted uh, the death of the queen, during which time you would expect people to be like at their most kind of fuzzy and, you know, um, British and all about unity and, and, and all of that. You know, any normal prime minister would have gotten a few easy brownie points by just like shedding a few tears and making a few speeches um, about the queen. But like her vibes are literally so bad uh, that that nothing um, else, that nothing else could compete. It's actually it's quite impressive. If there's one thing she can give herself credit for, it's it's that. <laughs> On that note, let's wrap up. I have to say I'm a little bit exhausted. Dahlia, it has been a pleasure being joined by you on this very dramatic evening. Lots of things to respond to. You've worked me hard this evening, Michael. Hard. <laughs> All the drama just kept just kept coming. Um, presumably it will continue after we go off air, but um, I'm, I'm not going to hang around for all of it. Um, you have to... Look for yourself whatever wacky things Tory MPs tweet over the next few hours or if they are, if there's, if, if Liz Truss is still Prime Minister tomorrow. I assume if she goes, um, we will do an emergency show. If not, we'll see you on Friday um, at 7pm. For now, you've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night. 